thank you very much for coming. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I hope that you will all um, listen eagerly and hopefully as we try to deal with what is one of the central problems of modernity, that we've entered into an age of pandemics. It doesn't take much to realize that over the last three decades, we've seen almost a cascade of new viruses, each one more exotic, troublesome, mysterious than the one before. And we've, we've been just doing that. We've been sort of sitting back as a spectator, watching these viruses and these new novel emerging diseases, and that's what they're called, emerging communicable diseases. We've been watching them, and we've been passive. And the thesis that our three guests here have today is that we need to not be passive. We need to not be spectators. We need to not wait until the next virus jumps from the next animal in the next tree. But we need to be active and get ahead of that curve and get two steps ahead of that next virus by knowing its name, knowing its characteristics, knowing where it's likely to come from before it emerges. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our three guests. Uh, and these have been written for me, so I have not. If they're short, it's not me. So this is, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dennis Carroll. Dennis is director of the Global Health Security and Development Unit at USAID, and he's really a legend in this field. He's one of the most wonderful people who have brought us to this moment in time, and a friend of many people here in this room. And I want to introduce uh, Jonah, uh, Jana uh, Mazet, uh, and she is at, uh, at Davis, UC Davis, an executive director of the One Health Institute, which is one of our hosts tonight. So thank you very much for hosting us, and at the School of Veterinary Medicine, and is an epidemiologist and a veterinary doctor, probably one of the most important two professions that you can have in the same person at this time. <laughs> and Nathan Wolf, a longtime friend of many people in the Bay Area, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Metabiota. So please welcome all three of our guests who are going to teach us how to be more proactive when facing this cascade of new viruses. Welcome. Thank you. So I'd like to start with Dennis, if I could. And uh, Dennis, I think that uh, everybody here in the room would uh, uh, probably look at this big idea that you're giving us that maybe you'll tell us a little bit more about and say it would be really wonderful if we already had a global uh, census or an atlas or uh, knew about all the viruses that had pandemic potential, understood their characteristics, knew the hot spots in the world where respiratory diseases or bloodborne pathogens were likely to occur, knew something about what the countermeasures would be. I think everybody would feel a little safer and a little better if such a thing existed. But it doesn't. So it's fair to have some concern or skepticism even. How big a challenge is this? What does it compare to in human history? What have we done like this? How much is it going to cost? Where are the resources going to come from? And I, I have only um, an hour to s say this, right? <laughs> Well, well, you no, can no. have all of my time. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was a lot of questions, but uh, look, Larry uh, began this discussion um, in a very thoughtful way. You know, we, we are living in an extraordinary time, and it's hard when you're in an extraordinary time sometimes to appreciate that, in fact, you are. Uh, and the single biggest reason we are in such an extraordinary time is because there are so many of us. There are seven plus billion people on the planet Earth. And uh, I was reflecting earlier in a discussion uh, with some interns, you know, that a hundred years ago in this city, when there was the great earthquake, the total population of the planet Earth was about 1.4 billion. Think about it. As a species, for as long as we've been on the planet, 
In the last 100 years, we've gone from 1.4 to 7.3 billion people. You can't do that and establish the kind of human settlements that, as a people we need, that you can't grow the kind of animal protein, engage in crop production and extractive industry work, and not have an extraordinary impact on the planet we live on. And what we've watched the three decades that Larry just made reference to are sort of the beginning of an extraordinary period that is going to carry us through to the better part of this century. The interactions between people and animal by virtue of that footprint is transforming the way our lives are going to play out in the decades to come. It's because all of these diseases that we're talking about, they have their genesis. The agents that are behind these viruses right now, they are circulating in wildlife animals. That's the mother load. But they've been out there and they've been separate from us because as a people we've had limited interactions. Either we've had limited interactions or the livestock that we grow have had limited interactions. At seven plus billion people, which will be 9.6 billion by the time we get to 2050, if we're lucky, and 11.5 billion by the time we get to the end of the century. We're on a trajectory. So these diseases that we're talking about are diseases that are going to be uh, emerging with an intensity unprecedented. If you go back over the last three decades, and you consider all of the events that have happened. You go to Nipah, you go to SARS, you go to influenzas, Ebola, um, MERS, uh, Ebola, uh, uh, Zika. Every one of those, we are acting after the fact. We are responding to something that emerges, and then we're trying to figure out how to respond to it. We don't have countermeasures, we don't have vaccines, and we frequently don't have drugs. And we find out that the only thing that has saved us each time is that the virus has run its own course in its own way, by and large. We are playing a game of Russian roulette. And the discussion that we have um, to present to you, and if you read the blog uh, that we posted earlier, it's about, it's a time that we begin thinking differently. And as Larry said, it's about moving from reactive to proactive. Because our strategy today as a people is to look for that first human index case and then begin to try and respond to that. But by then, we know we've lost the opportunity to really take the advantage. It's the opportunity to realize that that, that emergence in that human is uh, the near, nearly the last step in a long progressive evolutionary process that began way up back in that wildlife population. It's there. It's to be seen, it's to be discovered, it's to be characterized and understood and ultimately risked so that we know what is out there. Knowledge is powerful and right now we are pretty stupid about what's out there waiting for us. So the Global Virome Project fundamentally is about a challenge to turn the culture we have of reactivity to a culture of proactivity. Take the bull by the horns, take advantage of extraordinary science, which has been done, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And we live not just in an extraordinary time in terms of risk, we live in an extraordinary time in terms of possibility and the opportunity to exploit that. So we're here almost as, you know, the Blues Brothers, you know, we're on a mission from God um, to speak to you about an opportunity that we can, as a people, create a space that's not only better for us, but better for our children and our children's children. And this planet will be a far better place because of it. So that's so, my so answer. Let me ask Jana to make the case. Okay. So here's, here's the audience that, that I think, as I said, and I think everybody would agree, we'd like to see something like this in place. What is it that we would like to have seen? Okay. And how did we get there? So if we're here, as Dennis said, we're here in this place in time, unprecedented pressure that will cause this spillover and emergence of new diseases, new Zikas, new Ebolas. They're coming. You know, we don't want to be the people that are running from that, chasing that. We want to be the people that know what's out there and prevent 
the disease from those things. So if we can say, here's our place in time, we want to go this way. We want to go upstream. We want to know what's out there. So we want, as you say, the atlas, but we don't just want to know every virus that's out there. We want to know how they're transmitted, under what circumstances might we control them, how might we prevent them. Well, is that feasible? Are we at a place in time where we have to keep chasing? Or does the technology now exist? And are the people, are we, you in the audience, are you the coalition of the willing to make this happen? Can we make this happen? And I can tell you that because of Dennis's vision, and I agree with you, he's inspirational in this area, um, We've had the experience, Nathan and I, over the last few years with some of our other partners, including at EcoHealth Alliance, we've had the, the ability to try a pilot. Now, it's a pilot project we call the PREDICT project, funded by USAID and headquartered at UC Davis. Um, but we, we had the ability to work with about 35 countries in the world so far and try to get out there and say, is it feasible in these most vulnerable places where the, there's a lot of wildlife, high biodiversity, and a lot of humans, high population density, and they're interacting. Those happen to be in the places that are the most vulnerable but also the, the least served by health systems, by science, by education. So it, we're talking about in the tropics in the least developed countries in the world. So if it's possible to do it there, it's probably possible to do it anywhere. So our teams have gotten out there and worked with those um, countries and their systems, and we've gotten out in the field, and we've trained people, and we've collected samples. We've collected samples from uh, over 50,000 animals in those countries. Um, now we're also sampling people that are interacting with those animals. And what have we found? Well, we found about 1,000 viruses. So about 180 of those are sort of the known ones, some of them bad actors, those things that we know to cause disease in people. And about another 800 are new to us. Now, they're not new viruses, but they're, they're newly detected and characterized by people. So in the last just few years, we were able to, with a smaller amount of effort than we're talking about, a pilot project, discover 800 viruses. Now, during all of human history before this, 590 viruses in humans ha and mammals had been recognized. So that's what was out there, recognized by the international community as a virus of mammals, okay? And a far fewer of those were going between animals and people. So, so 590, about, at the beginning, less than that, but over time. And now we're coming up and we're saying, look, we can, by this targeted strategy and working in some of the toughest places, economically efficiently, really, find these viruses. So it's feasible. The time is right. So do we have the ability? Yes. Do we have the responsibility? I think so. If these things are continuing to spill over and if one of the greatest threats to our safety and security, um, our health, uh, are these new viruses spilling over, I think the time is right and it's feasible. And we could talk about the costs. You asked Dennis a lot of questions, but maybe we should, should move forward and let, let Nathan say something. I'm going to ask Nathan, Nathan the hardest Doing questions. Doing a good job, so. Uh, be, because it, it's not enough to identify swine flu or H1N1 or H3N2 or any of these viruses and to know their first name and their last name and their zip code. Because who would ever have expected that you could have so many different subspecies of H1N1 or H5N1 or, you know, even right now, who would have expected the knock-on effects of Zika, the sexual transmission, perhaps the transmission through other vital fluids, to be, and, and of course, the unthinkable teratogenicity, the birth defects. How do you put those things into your query so that when you're looking, you're looking at the pathogenicity, you're looking at the r not, the infectivity, you're looking at you're going to have to find the new virus, understand how it's transmitted, understand how that transmission can be interdicted, the consequences of it abated or prevented, at the same time as you're going to be saying, hello, what's your name and where do you live? And so it's, it's not just a atlas. It's not cross-sectional. It's, not a, not a, it's not a photograph. It's a motion picture. How do you, 
How do you even begin to ask those questions, Nathan? Yep. Um, so the way we think of it is risk stratification, right? So how do we identify which pathogens are the priority pathogens? And I think that is the fundamental question. And what's happened, and part of this has been predict, part of this has been great efforts that you've, you know, you supported through Google.org and Skull Global Threats, but we've made tremendous amount of advances in the way that we can sort through viruses to try to assess what their potential impact is. Um, history is one, right? We do have data on hundreds of epidemics that have happened in human populations, which permit us to identify characteristics, whether it's the way a virus is transmitted, what its particular viral family is, that help us to assess its potential for risk. There's also a range of new technologies that would be a part of this effort, right? So we don't see, yes, it's the case that right now we're fighting an invisible enemy, right? So it's, you have no sense of it. We're trying to create uh, response structures around the world, but we don't know the distribution of where the harmful viruses are. So we will be forced to invest an order of magnitude more energy in putting these resources everywhere, where if we knew in a targeted way what is the nature of that, we're, we're, we essentially can't use vaccine and drug strategies because the, the amount of time that it takes to develop these after a new agent has been uncovered is simply too long. And so we take one of the most powerful sets of tools that we have as a human population and essentially can't use them at all, again, because the enemy is effectively invisible. Um, you know, so we need to uncover the enemy, but, the, but you know, we're estimating somewhere in the order of half a million viruses with the potential to enter and be transmitted in human populations. So, so, so I think you should pause for just a second and let people digest that number. Half a million viruses that we don't know about. And of, of those, how many are friends and how many are foes? Yes. Well, I mean, I will say this is San Francisco. I look out into the audience and some of my colleagues I see who do, you know, big data. 500,000, of course, is not, even if you add the genome sizes, right, these are not necessarily big viruses. So I don't think that, it, look, and I don't mean to, to state that it's a small number, but the way that the technology is moving, right, and, and I think, you know, we can debate similarities and differences from the Human Genome Project, but we went from a situation over the course of not much more than 50 years where we didn't really understand the chemistry of genetic information to the point where we were able, you know, where really we have gone across the world. And when we started the Human Genome Project, it wasn't like we had a sense that we would map the human genome and suddenly it would produce all these incredible, you know, spin-offs that would be of value and information. It's only been as that process has emerged. Having said that, you know, we had a conversation today, Eric Delware was talking about, you know, technology which permits much more rapid development of assays which you can screen through large amounts of human populations to determine who's been infected. So that's a great question. You take that 500,000, that becomes your panel. You assemble information, you assemble samples from a representative group of humans around the world, and you, and now we can very feasibly scan through 500,000 viruses and determine who in the world has been, whether humans have been infected with particular virus classes. So we can immediately say, oh, okay, you know, and that may be sufficient for us to put those on the watch list, if you will, not necessary. There'll be some viruses that, that there's no evidence that people have been infected with viruses that'll be of interest and importance. And we'll have other techniques we'll have to merge for that, but there will be a whole range of concomitant technologies which will emerge out of this effort, v again, in a way that I think is very parallel to this idea of a campaign and a challenge, sort of a moonshot, if you will, to unite people around this particular cause of, you know, we're still the, we live in a world where you think about cardiology, right? And if, if you go to your physician and you say, oh, I've got, you know, I've got um, high blood pressure and cholesterol and all these things, and if they said, oh, you know what, we're gonna wait for the heart attack, We've got really good capacity for bypass surgery, don't worry. And that's the world that we live in. And the question is how do we, w some of the beautiful elements of the Human Genome Project was its tangibility, right? And so the idea is how do we unite the world around moving us from this reactive approach to a proactive approach? And is, is identifying every virus out there or the vast majority of viruses that have the potential to enter humans gonna be the full answer? No. Is it going to have to be related to a whole 
range of other efforts, yes. But is it a tangible goal? You know, can we, after the course of 10 years, come back and say, hey, we got it. We got these viruses. It's not an invisible enemy. You know, we may not know its strategies. We may not know exactly where it is at all times, but we know what the enemy looks like. We've got it. Um, and that, I think, will, you know, and we haven't even spoken about some of the, um, you know, what John and Dennis have referred to as the halo effect, which if you look at the Human Genome Project, you're, the estimates are that for every dollar invested, you had something about $140, $150 of return in investment associated with that project. You know, we've been focused in our discussion about epidemics and pandemics, and certainly we're not very good at relative risk. When we look at as devastating as they are terrorist incidents compared to 40 million people dying of HIV, I mean, anyway, you can do the numbers yourself to really think about whether we're good as a population sorting out relative risk. But there will be other benefits besides epidemics associated with this effort. One that is uh, sort of near and dear to my heart is thinking about um, HPV and, you know, cervical cancer, right? For all the four and a half billion dollars a year that NCI puts into cancer research, and many of that, you know, a lot of that is very good investment, the, some of the biggest findings in the history of cancer that have had the biggest impact have been epidemiological findings. Link between tobacco and lung cancer, link between HPV and cervical cancer. How many other viruses are out there that are causing cancer that are unknown? Well, if we map the viruses, one of these halo effect concomitant benefits associated with this effort is maybe we'll uncover a virus that's associated with cancer. Well, suddenly, then you can develop a vaccine. <laughs> and, you know, so... But let, let me just interrupt you because I want to tell the audience that this is the time for you to be thinking about the questions that you want to ask. Uh, be, you'll be getting little cards. You already have cards. Uh, and write your questions down, raise your hand, and... Someone will come and collect them, and we'll consolidate them, and we'll ask our, our experts here. I'm going to toss them a softball question in the meantime. Oh, sure, after, uh, after you throw me the hard one. It's only fair. <laughs> I'll take the I'm teasing. So, all right, so the, the, the easy one. You know, you're in Silicon Valley. You're in San Francisco. Um, I think Nathan said it well, to look, on, uh, look at the knock-on benefits. Um, I mean, certainly... We witnessed the birth of Google and Facebook and eBay, and we've seen entire worlds change. Um, if you have a, uh, a common basic tool, such as this project that you're thinking of doing, and you turn it loose to the great minds that we have at our universities and in our tech universe, what if you just allow yourself a little, a little freedom, there's the softball question, um, what do you think can happen? Where do you think we can go? This is for anybody on the panel. Sure. Look, I'm going to answer a question that you asked two of us that we haven't answered you yet, and then I'll go back to that, mm -hmm. which is how much it'll cost, how long will it last, right? And all of this discovery that we're talking about, 10 years, $3.5 billion. Compared to... Think about the cost of Ebola, $7 billion. Think about the annualized cost of uh, pandemic prevention around the world, the lingering consequences of all of these things, $30 billion a year. So $3.5 billion, 10 years. By 2026, we could be living in a world that is rich with both the immediate intended consequences of enhanced knowledge, risk stratification, but all of these other halo effects that we're talking about, which is new technologies, um, new innovative approaches to thinking about biomedical countermeasures, right, above and beyond what might be an antiviral or a vaccine. There's a, there are discoveries out there to be made that we're not even aware of. And so so while, while you're thinking about that, please raise your hand if you have a question to ask. And give your card to one of the monitors who will bring them forward. And I, I just want to say something in support of that. Um, when we were looking at H5N1 in 2005, 2006, 2007, the Bank of Montreal was asked by the Canadian government, which had had a difficult experience with SARS, if you recall, what would a real pandemic cost the global economy? And after studying that for almost a year, the answer that came back was 3 to 
of global GDP. That, that was at a time when the, the global GDP was $50 trillion. You're talking about as much as four, five, six, seven trillion dollars. You're not talking about three and a half billion dollars. So that, no, I just wanted to add a little bit. But, but exactly. let's do one more attempt to kind of think about these spin-off benefits. And I'm going to look at these questions and see if I can find the toughest one and give it to Nathan. Okay, good. <laughs> then I'll answer. Now, <laughs> so while we think of this as a moonshot, it's achievable, right? We made it to the moon. And we think of this as um, it's a lot of money. Nobody has any qualms about saying that's a lot of money. But we know that that amount of money pales in comparison. Right now, our, our country just here is faced with a challenge that has been around the globe for decades that we ignored, right? Zika virus, okay? And right now it's here coming your way it's in the mosquitoes probably you know it's 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 time to be not chasing these things and not instantly thinking about relieving and taking about a billion dollars and putting that towards Zika to chase something that will probably be a little late we're probably not going to have much in the way of countermeasures vaccines or anything until it's spread Okay, that's what we saw with West Nile. Everybody, you know, worries about Ebola. We saw what happened in Dallas. So we're talking about a billion dollars for that. And we're talking about $350 million a year for 10 years to, instead of be chasing those things, to know ahead and be ready for them. And a big side benefit that isn't in the clouds and isn't thinking about the, um, you know, the potential halo, but a really important benefit that happens in real time that we've already found with our pilot project is as you build the capacity to detect these things, in every single country where we're working, we're building the lab capacity, and we already now have those countries, more than 30, who can detect those viruses at the site. If we had that before the Ebola virus epidemic started in West Africa, we wouldn't have waited months to be able to have an international response that allowed it to get out of control and, and kill the people that it did. We could have diagnosed it. Right now, frankly, we'll be able to diagnose it tomorrow, right, because they're diagnosing it now. But this project has a side benefit of being able to improve the technologies and the laboratories in the country as we go. So every country we add to the portfolio can now take care of their business, right? And don't have to wait and call upon WHO and the US CDC to get in there and diagnose their problems. So that's a huge, real benefit that we can see immediately. Then we can dream and we can get these viruses into the hands of our colleagues here at UCSF, at Columbia University where we work with great colleagues, at all these wonderful virologists at my own university and others in the private sector that are dreaming big. And so we can get that, we can make that happen. And then it is unimaginable, really. And we have some absolutely terrific questions here. Um, and they run the gamut, as you might expect, from Zika and the Olympics to Ebola to climate change uh, to bioterrorism. So I'm going to try to give you a chance at, at all of them. Um, and I'll, I'll ask you the first one, uh, which I will, I'd like to join in on if, if, you, if you duck it. Uh, the question is, how would you respond to the argument that pandemic viruses play a good role in curbing ballooning population? Well, that's. Um, yeah, that, yeah. Well, it was. Uh, um, <laughs> no, happy to. Um, and I think it's a it's a it's an important question because it's one that if you're not if you're not familiar with the impact of these epidemics and pandemics, it's sort of a, it's a straight it's a question that makes sense to people. Um, but the reality is even for the moment, and I'm not suggesting that we do this, let's say for the moment though as a thought experiment we decide, well really we do want to um, radically control human population. You would never ever use epidemics and pandemics as the system by which you would enact that objective. You're talking about the shock and impact associated with these ev events. Forget about lives lost, huge. Forget about devastation to families, huge. Forget about livelihoods. The speed at which these have the potential to hit would be so devastating that any benefit that somebody could imagine associated with a decreased population would be way offset by the harm done to the sort of radical 
um, change to human populations. That's just one of a number of, you know, you know sort of perspectives on this. Yeah. I, I would go back to the number you quoted about three to seven trillion dollars. It's not dollars. It's society is collapsing in the midst of that kind of impact. Um, and you would have a global event that would be so disruptive that the people that would die from the infection would only be the tip of the iceberg. The numbers of lives lost and the consequences to us as a species due to the l uh, loss of uh, civil order, social structure, would be extraordinary. You're talking about something that would happen in the period of months. Jonah, would you mind if I jumped in? Please. You know, this is a very personal question for me because when I came back after a decade of working to eradicate smallpox, and I'd been out of the country for a long time, I came back and I was so proud of what we had done. And this was the question I got all the time. Don't you think that eradicating smallpox will contribute to the population explosion? And it's actually totally the opposite. And, and just bear with me for a second because when, when I was a professor teaching epidemiology back in the 12th century, <laughs> we had something that we called the child survival hypothesis. And the hypothesis, which came out of Johns Hopkins, was that if children lived into the fullness of adulthood, and remember, we were talking about places that had a death rate in children under five of 50%. The hypothesis was that parents have replacement births when they lose a child. They have <coughs> insurance births in case they might lose a child. They have lotto births in case one of their kids could be a truck driver or get a government job. That was the hypothesis that if you could take the death rate from 50% and lower it, parents and peasants are not stupid. They have the hardest decisions to make with the least amount of resources in the world, that parents would make the decision, if they knew their children were going to live, to have smaller families. That was called the child survival hypothesis. I can tell you now, it's the child survival theorem. We know that's true. We know it in every country. We've studied it after every disease. In fact, it may be that the only way we're not going to reach 11 or 12 billion population is if we can ensure every parent that their children will live into the fullness of adulthood. But I really appreciate the question. It's not a dumb question mm -hmm. at all. It is the right question to begin an incredibly important conversation, as are all these other questions. So here's a hard question. I won't ask it. Anybody? <laughs> if a novel virus predicted to be a global threat was identified right now, what happens next? Sure. So I think first and foremost, that we know it exists means that we can get it into the hands of, that I mentioned and that you mentioned of the brilliant minds to help think about countermeasures, right? So for that one virus, we can think about vaccines and treatments and all of those things. So that's immediate. I think even more immediate, we know about it. And as I mentioned, we can now test for it in the locations where we know it exists. We can also look for it in other locations so we can predict where it might occur. So that means we can put in place educational campaigns about how to prevent infection and spillover. It also means that we can put into place systems in case we need to reduce transport and trade, which now we see with Ebola where we know it occurs Occurs, those systems get in place and, and, and little epidemics are happening all the time. We don't hear about them here because they get controlled because we have the knowledge. So I think the knowledge there is very powerful. But really uh, what I want to see and what I'd like to encourage is that we don't need to just know about that one, that one that, that might be the threat. We need to know about all of them and why. Because we don't want to keep chasing each one, making a new vaccine. It's very expensive. It costs a billion dollars to get a vaccine to market and it takes time. We need to know about all the ones that can be infective and what are those pieces that make them infective to people so that we can start to develop a whole new suite of countermeasures, as Dennis says. We need vaccines that don't just 
look at the last variety of flu that came last year or our best educated guess at what flu might come next year. We need a vaccine that helps protect us against all the flus. And without knowing about all those that are out there, it's really hard to make that target. Same for antivirals. We've learned a lot of lessons about how we use antibiotics for bacteria, but we need to learn those lessons and then understand the viruses that are out there and start having some effective antivirals. Dennis, um, we sometimes call ourselves the left coast mm -hmm. here in San Francisco. Um, uh, and uh, we were talking earlier and you were saying that you want to move the curve two steps to the left. Mm -hmm. Now, for our listeners on the radio, that's not a political statement. That's an epidemiological statement. Mm -hmm. Why is that an epidemiological statement? Well, if I was in Israel, I would have said two steps to the right, right? <laughs> it's just our, 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 we, we conceptually move mm -hmm. from left to right. Mm -hmm. it, it's basically what it's really saying is that there's an evolutionary pathway, whether it's left, right, north, or south is not the issue we tend to respond to that evolutionary pathway really towards the end point. When something, you know, th the purpose of evolution is to diversify your species that you occupy. It increases the odds that you as a particular organism will survive. The more that you occupy specially, the greater um, likelihood that you will in fact, you know, Darwinian dynamics in play. And so, we represent a delightful reservoir for lots of viruses out there that would enhance their survivability. And so our looking only when that virus gets into us misses all the opportunities to understand when that virus was acquiring those special um, biological features which spoke to its ability to infect and replicate and potentially uh, kill us. So it's moving it in the direction of the evolutionary pathway upstream earlier to identify those events that confer the um, biological properties that make it potentially dangerous to people. But that process occurs not in people, it occurs in animals. So follow it in animals and that will give us a window into risk and then that allows us then to be much more attentive. And I, and I would like to underscore that this issue about the spillover event that we talk about, that moving from an animal into a person, that's not an inevitable event. It's, an, it's a consequence of the way we interact with animal populations. And with seven billion people, that consequence plays itself out much more dramatically. But the act of discovery of these viruses doesn't just tell us which are genetically most dangerous, but they also tell us about their viral ecology. And that knowledge about viral ecology allows us to understand what animals, what the people in that area are interacting with, and it allows us to be preventive and stop that spillover in the first place. So you've got two, you've got two arms to this whole response capability that are preemptive, right? So. So we have a question um, that I think is on the lines of a lot of people. We have three or four questions about Zika. Let me see if I can summarize and put them all together. Is it as bad as they say? Why didn't we know it was coming? What's its relationship to climate change? How is it affecting the Olympics? And what should we worry about the most? So. Take any of these. I'm happy to talk about Zika. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. So, um, just a when I look at my own career, a trivial bit of information in my career was that I actually studied Zika when I um, during the late '90s I lived in Malaysia and, and studied the transmission of vector-borne diseases between animals and human populations. And among the things we looked at was Zika. Um, and we saw evidence at that time that individuals, you know, had been infected with Zika and that those had, that had more proximity to animals were having higher transmission rates and we saw it in animal populations. So Zika is not anything that's, you know, new to our knowledge. It's not an unknown virus. Um, you know, it's a flavivirus. It affects Aedes aegypti. Um, and we've had 
I mean, what what we should have and did anticipate about um, 80s born mosquito viruses is their potential to move because we've seen that happen I get before. We've seen it with dengue, we've seen it with chikungunya, um, and there's a pattern by which the distribution of 80s has affected that. When it comes to you know, climate change, that's certainly um, very relevant. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily always relevant for all of the diseases that we deal with. Some, some are likely completely unrelated to climate change. Vector-borne disease is not amongst those. Um, if you look at the uh, sort of the lifespan and the life history of these mosquito populations, it's very much dependent upon um, physical environmental characteristics, and they live around a certain band. And as that band changes by increase in temperature, changes in humidity pattern, the distribution of 80s mosquitoes changes. And so, um, you know, the fact that we have uh, flavivirus associated emergence, I think, shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us. Um, and, you know, what's going to happen to it, um, you know, I think we have, frankly, among many of the things we've looked at, we've got fairly good models in terms of chicken and dengue, in terms of what's happened to those viruses in the past, and uh, so our expectations about Zika, um, you know, while they won't be perfectly mirrored by those, those provide us with a real good baseline to think about, about how Zika would, will be transmitted. Would your, the question is, would your project, if it were in place, have been able to predict that Zika would be sexually transmitted and that at the same time would cause birth defects in the quantity and in the horror that we are seeing? Um, you know, certainly distribution of Zika and knowledge of Zika is exactly the kind of things that we're talking about in all these viruses. Um, you know, with regards to, right, and we spoke a little bit before about identifying the diversity of viruses and then going from that point to determining which of those are the risky viruses. And I think all of us freely admit that's, you know, that's part of the challenge and that's part of the scientific excitement of this project is that risk stratification. And it's what everybody in our field recognized needs to happen one way or the other. Um, but there's a whole range of approaches to that. Again, we were having this conversation today. And not that it's an easy approach, but cell culture, right? So you could take and grow in culture human cells from each of the different tissue types that we have, whether it be um, liver cells, blood cells, et cetera. You can take these unknown viruses and determine in whether, number one, are they capable of infecting human cells? Number two, which cells of humans are they capable of infecting? That can give you a clue to the route of transmission. Right? So we should see proliferation, for example, if we're seeing sexual transmission, there'll be certain cell types that viruses are capable of being transmitted in. So again, it's not to say that it, there aren't hard elements of this science, but there's very practical approaches. I don't see the problem, y you know, and, and HIV is the counterexample, but if you look at the challenges of cancer and the ch challenges of these viruses, cancer is a much harder problem than, you know, by and large, when we know what a virus is, we develop a vaccine against it, right? You know, there's retroviruses present a certain case, some viruses, you know, but really what it is is about knowing the virus to be able to, to make that step. Yeah. Well, can can yeah. I just follow up on that and you can answer the follow up or continue? Oh, sure. Well, why don't you go ahead and then Well, then I'll I, I just wanted to follow up that, that the bottom line is, and it's a great question from the audience or the combined question, is that when we know what a virus is, we could make a vaccine to it, but we don't until it affects us here or in the North. I'm sorry, mm, but yeah. that's the yeah. that practical reality, and that has to do with the cost of getting that to market, and then, you know, who's going to buy the vaccine, and, you know, USAID and other aid agencies does a great job getting those vaccines out and, and paying for those. But the bottom line is, do we know about some viruses already that we should be doing more about? Yes. Mm. There must and be something really amazing about Davis because <laughs> your answer and the, the questionnaire is also from Davis. Oh. And the, the question leads right into that. It's, it, it's sort of saying, do you think that the link between virus and cancer affecting as it would then the rich countries. Do you think that would help to raise the three and a half billion dollars? Mm -hmm. Do you think that would help to raise understanding? Uh, and do you have any examples of links that you suspect between viruses and cancer that might 
stimulate wider spread interest in your project in the rich countries. Uh, yeah, and, and, and if I could combine that with finishing this thought on, on Zika is that when we um, know about viruses, we aren't necessarily doing the right thing. And I think what we're hoping to catalyze with this project is a whole paradigm shift. So we are talking about what we know is achievable, and that is the two steps to the left or whichever direction, but upstream to know what viruses are out there so that we can do something about it. But it's in order to get people to do something about it, right? So it's not just to know, it's to say, we have the responsibility now that when we know we do something about it, we characterize them more fully, we take steps towards understanding them better so that we don't wait until they hit our shores. Um, because it's where these things spill over, where the people are generally most vulnerable, and that's where we pay the least attention. And we're a global community now. We can't, we can't do that anymore. So to the point of the question is, does it take until it gets to the wealthy um, before we develop um, a response that's proactive instead of, you know, like your heart example? Um, right now it is, but what we're trying to do is catalyze a change. Um, and, and that's really part of what two steps to the left is. Don't wait until rich people are affected by it. <laughs> Jump in now. Right. And I think even rich people now know, you know, they're, they're not all evil rich people out there waiting. Oh, I don't want to help anybody, right? It's not, that's not what it's about. But, but even every, I guess everybody in this audience, and, and you are the rich people, whether you think so or not, um, but uh, everybody in this audience now is thinking about all of these viruses that are happening all over the world. Everyone's life is lives are touched. So I, I think I think there is that that momentum is building, um, and a project like this can really uh, push it. Uh, what are the methods you use to uh, estimate 500,000 uh, unknown viruses, and can you share why you came to that number? Sure. No, go you ahead. want me to do it? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we have, the, we have the benefit of this pilot project, the PREDICT project, and within that, it really is a pilot. So in most of the places where we've worked, we haven't gotten, obviously by the numbers I gave you before, we haven't discovered all the viruses in those places, but we have been able within that project to intensively look at some of the species that we think are the, the hosts of the, the the most likely host for spillover. And if we intensively look at those species, we can continually increase our sample size to detect virus, 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 until we start to level off that curve. So we've detected almost all the viruses. Now we've detected as many as we can, but we still see that the line on that curve is going, so there's maybe one or two we're missing. So by doing that, we can understand how many virus per species that we've started to look at are probably out there. We also can understand how much it costs to get there. And what we found is as you're following that curve and the curve starts to flatten out as we're discovering virus, as you get to the rarer ones, the harder to discover ones, it gets more expensive because now you're searching. So to get to the top of that curve um, costs uh, a, a lot of money to go all the way out. So for a species, it costs over a million dollars per species, sort of, if you really do that work to get all the way out. But if you want 99% of them, you're way over here. It cuts the cost in half. So we can do a good job at estimating because we know we've done a, a lot of work and, and the collective scientific community has done a lot of work on what hosts should be looked at. So we kind of know those. We know that we need to look at mammals. We know we need to look at water birds. If we think about all the mammals and the influenzas, at least in the water birds, we know how many species of mammals and water birds are out there. And then we can start to estimate, well, we know how much it costs to discover all of them in each of those species so we can extrapolate. You've got about 10 more minutes, um, and we've got three questions uh, that are very similar. What are the new technologies you use and definitions for risk stratification, given our inability as a society to deal with risk, understand risk, mm -hmm. understand relative risk? How does just stratifying risk help us operationally? And within the category of risk, assuming now we're talking about impact and pathogenicity of a virus, what are the big things that you'd like people here to think about that characterize why a virus 
is a greater risk than another virus. So a lot of questions about risk. And yeah. Can I take the last questions mm -hmm. and then you sure. can take yeah. the, you know, the issue about risk is ultimately it's a risk which of those viruses out there have that potential for adapting, getting and um, thriving in our species. Can they replicate? That's going to be the key issue. And then what consequences of that infection might be. To the extent that the process of discovery can allow us to sort out among those 500,000, which of those ones that have that affinity for our receptor binding, that allow for um, that first step of infection to occur, you can separate those out from those viruses that do not have that affinity. And that allows you to begin thinking about which of those that have evolved in a, uh, in a direction that speak to our potential for um, being vulnerable. That's sort of the highest order of risk. But I, I actually wanted to go back to this issue about Zika for a moment, if I could. Sure. Um, because, because it also goes back to how we deal with risk. And Jonna mentioned a paradigm shift. We're, this isn't just about knowledge, it's how we use that knowledge. And we do not use knowledge well now. We've known about Zika, we've known about Ebola, and we've done nothing about them in, in all those years. It means we're not doing something right. And we're saying if we get more knowledge, suddenly we're gonna get things right. Well, no, it's not. We have to get more knowledge, but we have to change the way we use that knowledge so that we can be um, more forward-leaning. And the question about Zika is a really good one. If we had had this um, activity underway already, what we wouldn't have learned was just about Zika and the other flaviviruses. What we would have learned is about the constellation of all the flaviviruses. And it would have allowed us not to develop an intervention for Zika mm -hmm. or dengue. It would allow us to challenge ourselves to develop a sort of a family level intervention. So we're not just waiting for individual members of that family uh, to evolve into being bad actors. They're all going to evolve. The thing that unifies all of these viruses that we're concerned about is they're highly mutagenic. So a snapshot in time today is that they may not have the properties that speak to high risk, but they're in a family that is high risk. Ultimately, the countermeasures you want to develop speak to that family because they are from a pedigree that speaks bad. And using preventive measures, knowing the viral ecology allows us, again, to speak at the family level and disrupt. So I think the, the question about how we use knowledge requires a radical transformation of the way we invest, and we need to invest against risk. Today, we only invest against what's kicking our door down. And so we need to be much smarter and develop our risk modeling to the extent that it gives us a high level of confidence that when we talk about risk, we talk about our collective vulnerability, not just today, but in terms of our movement forward as a species. And we have to address that. Everything we do over the next 10 years, those species will evolve. We've got about five more minutes. And I've got two questions that I've got here, and I hope that one will be easy and the other hard. Uh, the hard one, we're going to end from somebody else from Davis. Oh. <laughs> so the easy, what I hope will be an easy one is, how much do we need to worry about our dogs and our cats and our domestic animals? You said wild animals, but are our pets harboring secrets? I kind of still want to answer your technology question that didn't get answered. But, I mean, look, I think it's... Um, it is very interesting, and there's a number of dimensions to it. I mean, among the modeling exercises, one of the things that's interesting to think about is we're so attached to our companion animals that if there ever were agents that were, um, you know, very very transmissible associated with them that had a harm to human populations, it would it would suffice it to say, just like all of the animals that are part of this sort of biological skin that we've created around this planet, they they play a role in these sorts of things and need to be considered. Technology, I did want to talk a little bit about technology. I want to talk about a new technology and an old technology. Um, a new technology, and it's one that's very exciting because you could have conceived of this project 
you know, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, even maybe 30 or 40 years ago, but you could have never conducted it. And so there is a, um, a new realm of technologies that really permit for the first time us to be able to have a sense of the viruses out there that can harm us. And a lot of this relates to our capacity to um, sequence uh, the genetic information of these viruses at a reasonable cost. And this is something which is moving uh, arguably faster than Moore's law in terms of decreasing the price cost to sequence things. And, um, and one of the, the PREDICT partners um, conducted a study on Zika, which also shows the power of understanding the sequence data that goes beyond just um, identifying new things, but it shows the power. Um, and basically, this was the first study to really look in detail at the genetic information from Zika from eight different specimens from Brazil. And by comparing this to what we know about the genetic information from Zika broadly, it's not just that we can say, oh, okay, here's some genetic variants that exist in these different places, but if we know the time that the samples were taken, and if we know the geography, we can actually use that information to extrapolate epidemiological characteristics. When did it enter? How fast is it moving? What's its transmissibility? And so the kinds of sequence data that we're talking about assembling um, from the Global Virome Project is not just going to provide information about sort of what's out there, which in and of itself is important, but directionality. The other technology is a very old one, which is uh, insurance. Um, and for someone who, uh, you know, normally is talking about deadly viruses, I find myself these days talking a lot about insurance and why I find it so fascinating. And basically, we have an incredible mechanism that we have um, created for, you know, is so old that it's a defining feature of humanity, which is risk transfer, which is the idea that not everybody holds the same amount of risk, and you can, if you understand the nature of that risk, you can transfer it. And there's been um, a set of work by risk analytics companies like ours and others, and organizations like the World Bank, which are really attempting to quantify this risk and permit insurance policies to take place, and a whole range of risk transfer is emerging. Now, if you only know a certain number of viruses out there, you can't create insurance policies that address them. And these insurance policies can be for corporations, they could be individuals, they can also be for countries. Now imagine a country, you know, which is a poor country that has insurance associated with epidemics. Now you have an epidemic in that country, um, the insurance kicks in, it feeds directly into response. So you're not dealing with the financial logistics that are hugely costly, and we saw that devastatingly in the case of Ebola, number one. Number two, you only get the funds if you actually measure your cases, so it increases incentive for surveillance, and if you're transparent about those cases, so it increases the potential that information will be out there. So, you know, I do think that there is this very exciting emerging ecosystem of technologies, and I don't just mean sort of fancy sequencing equipment. Those are important, yeah. but also things like insurance. It's very interesting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the head of the World Bank is a physician, Jim Kim, and he is trying to do exactly what Nathan was, was talking about. Uh, one of the motivators is that the private sector has been exiting the field of insurance for pandemics. And even Warren Buffett, for example, has been saying, oh my God, this is something that is too complex even for me. We can't gauge the risk. So there's a lot, I think, in what you say. If you can bring in more data, if you can, uh, instead of giving the insurance community that big of the picture, but a bigger picture, they can begin to use their stochastic processes and, and um, go back to Switzerland and do all their reinsurance. I have one final question. Uh, and it comes from UC Davis. And it'll sound easy, but I think it's a really hard question and it's a really good one for us to end on. It is, in fact, assuming that you're successful, when will we know that we're done? When one more mutation can happen that can unspill everything, how can our models predict that thing which has never happened before? And do we run the risk of, re of, of becoming dependent on a model that's based on the past instead of the future? We have a 10-year exercise in discovery. This effort is never done. I mean, I think that's a, that's, that, that's a key issue. And models are not static. And the whole process of discovery, and then uh, beyond the discovery, then the characterization and the risk, 
And again, because all of these, I mean, th th all of these viruses fall into families that speak to being highly mutagenic. They're constantly changing. And then you put it in the context of climate change and all of the ecologic variances that are going on and going from 7 billion to 9 billion, 11 billion. Those are still going to play themselves out. So this is a dynamic process that needs to be incorporated into our societal DNA as a way of continuing to do this work. It's not a one-off. The discovery part is a one-off exercise. But the um, preventing bad things from happening is forever. But you're doing it with a much richer, deeper knowledge base than you had before. So uh, we may not know when the program comes to an end, but we know our program is coming to an end. And I, I think the answer to your question uh, back to UC Davis is that we, we don't have to know we're at the end. We need to know how much closer we are to a safe world. And that brings us back to what we talked about at the very beginning. I think all of us, having heard what the possibilities are of applying new science and great vision and aspiration and funds to the problem of increasing more complex, more exotic, more frightening pandemics, we all would love that something like this existed. We can envision ways in which our scientists and our companies and our individual leaders could do great things with this. And we're wondering how we will get there. And now we're asking the question of how will we know we're there when we get there. And what I take away is it, it, it doesn't matter that we're not at the end, that we've not solved every problem. But we are facing a cascade of novel emerging pandemic risks. What's been proposed tonight is an exciting way to think about how we can mitigate that number, reduce the risk, if not completely, incrementally. And for that, I would like to thank our panelists and ask you to join me in thanking them for coming. And I, on behalf of the World Affairs, I ask you to join and thank them and our host for bringing us all together. And I want to thank you, the audience, for your terrific questions. Good night. And our host. Yes.